There you go. You can see my screen and definitely hear me, so we're good with that. The two goals for today, updates and questions, very similar to what we've done in the past, and then the content presentation. Content presentation today, I want to dip back a little bit more into the partition of Palestine, uh, which then gets us into the Arab-Israeli wars a little bit, and I've covered some of that, and then I want to get into the situation of Iran after World War II and bring that up to the, the present. All right, so we know that uh, modules are open on Monday. They close on Saturday at 11.59, and then I use Sunday for grading. Uh, this week has been uh, Module 15, the Middle East uh, from 1970, of what you've been working on. Uh, there's some very good readings in there, U.S. strategy uh, in the Middle East, and today um, we may get into some of that when I kind of move through Palestine, uh, this partition issue with the U.N., and involving Britain, uh, the U.S., and a number of other countries as well. So if you're into week uh, 15, there's an audio recording on a daring rescue that's really good. You need to listen to that one. Um, and then the media clip, um, uh, the Gulf Coast Cooperation Council, and one on the Crown Prince. All right. So next week, then, I'll try to give an overview of uh, 2000 to the present 2021, 20, uh, and the focus will still be on the Iranian uh, revolution and other things that have been uh, happening. And so uh, we'll try to put that together. I'll also uh, cover a little bit more on the wars uh, that, are, that take place between Egypt uh, and Israel and the Palestinian issues uh, that take place. So that's what we have for uh, week 16. All right. And so the readings next week then are going to focus on the causes and significance of the Iranian revolution and other revolutions that take place in the Middle East. There's a great podcast next week dealing with the uh, revolution by the BBC. And then the media clip goes into Iran uh, at 100 years. All right. So that'll be um, interesting for you to take a look at that. Now, the focus... Uh, the rest of this week uh, and next week and then the following week, which is week 17. So next week will be our last live broadcast. That's week 16. There's a module 16 for you to work on. And then week 17, there's no live broadcast. That is the final exam week or examination week. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit here. So what you need to be doing since we finished uh, all of those reflections, this is the time that... Uh, to polish um, your paper, uh, the research paper that you've been working on, the document that you selected, and get it ready uh, for uh, submittal. And then you need to start preparing for the uh, final exam. And remember, there's going to be three essay questions. Now, you can use some of the questions that I pose here in the collaborate sessions. Um, you can write on any of those. Those sometimes I get all of them on the questions, but if I don't, if you don't see them and you've, jot, you've jotted them down as I've covered them, then um, you're more than welcome to use those questions uh, to work on. So you're going to need three of them, right? Most of the draft copies of the papers, so those that came in the last a couple of days, I haven't gotten to yet, but uh, spent considerable time um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, getting those all worked on um, and got those back to with uh, some comments as to the things that uh, you need to do. But now's the time to make the revisions to the paper. In so doing, uh, you need to meet the page requirements. Those are pretty critical. Um, each one of those questions, there's a page requirement, and you need to meet the page requirement. It needs to be double-spaced um, as well. Key uh, is a selected bibliography. You have to have your bibliography according to the Turabian sheet. So you look at that that I have set up uh, in research work and the assignments. You look at the Turabian style manual. Underneath that's a link. You click on that, and then you see the actual tip sheet that tells you how to put a selected bibliography together. 
So we really don't want to use references, things I looked at, works cited, references, whatever all that is. It seems to be all over the place. So you two words selected bibliography. And you really should underline the words. Then you alphabetize everything. And then if the citation happens to be three lines, uh, the first line you type out, and then the second and third line are indented. And then you go on to the next citation, and there's only one space between those citations. And then what you do is you uh, move ahead and number the pages. So if this was uh, more a two, three, well, it's already a 200 course, but if we were in the late, you know, like 290s, the 300 level junior courses, um, you would then separate the sources in the bibliography into primary sources, secondary sources, and then you would go into journal. Then there would be a category for journal articles, websites, microfilms, interviews, podcasts, media clips, whatever it is. So everything is broken out. But you don't need to do that. All you need to do is alphabetize everything on the, the last page of the paper. Make sure you number the paper top right with your last name with a comma. Then you spell the word page out. Remember, no abbreviations. And then you have a comma after page, and you put the number one. And then you do that for each consecutive page, two, three, four, until you get to the last page, which is the uh, selected uh, bibliography uh, for you. All right? Next week uh, on Wednesday, it's the 12th, I'll uh, open the link for the study questions, and you start on uh, preparing. You'll have one week to prepare ahead of time to prepare for the three essays to work on them. Better to use everything that's in the modules, the textbooks, the textbook material um, that's been assigned, uh, the other additional readings, the media clips, and uh, the podcast, because the questions will generally come from, from that end. You know, if somebody hasn't done anything, and I know you folks are here on a regular basis, you have, is they're going to really be hustling uh, to watch all those media clips if I ask them to you know, pick four media clips from the last eight modules and uh, give me the major focus of those. So I'll have to be watching quite a bit of work here. So the idea is to sequence and keep up. So you've got uh, my takeaway questions, plus you've been keeping up with the media material and the uh, podcast, and you've been working on your paper, so it should be fine. So I'll have maybe 12, 15 questions that'll be open. Uh, for you on uh, May 12th, and you'll be ready to go uh, for those. And so the study questions uh, are the, the, uh, the exam questions, right? Then what I'll do is go back and open up the modules uh, from 8 to 16. So if you want to go back and look some things up, that'll be fine. You can do that as well. All right, so don't, don't forget the study questions are the final exam questions. You have one week to do that. And I want material focused out of the modules or from the collaborate sessions and not outside sources. We don't need to go to outside sources. Everything focuses in the modules. The link then to submit the three questions and submit your paper will be open on Wednesday the 19th, and you'll have until Friday, uh, May 21st at 1159. In the selected bibliography, you should have at least uh, five academic sources. Um, that includes the, your textbook. That includes journal articles. You can use material that I've covered in the collaborate sessions. And the main thrust is university press publications, uh, academic uh, publications that are written by scholars who know certain fields very well, that you know the information is pretty much reliable, uh, not hearsay or what you pick up in a newspaper or uh, find in an encyclopedia. All right. And there should be a strong focus on that civilization model, which I've seen in the papers, and then a, a, a very strong focus on the constructs. Those are the applications that are there. You have to apply certain things to the document. If you have any questions, uh, send me an email on that. It'll be fine. And make sure you have a chronology. Um, and it'd be nice to draw it out if you can. Uh, if you're having difficulty doing that, uh, then you can explain it and kind of just you know, put the dates on the left or right side and then tell me what's going on relative to the document. Uh, if you've got 15 or 20 dates on it, that's too many, uh, based on what the document is and, and what you work around with it, uh, you're, you're looking four or five, six dates at the most. You know, if you wanted eight or nine, I suppose you could do that, but you don't need to, you know, you know press it to try to 
you know, put something in there that's really not there. So you're only dealing with one specific document like that. Okay. All right. Now, uh, work in the paper, uh, edu, or any website, org.gov, org .edu .org .gov. It's, uh, it's all possible. Stay away from, uh, you know, Wikipedia and stay away from encyclopedias and dot-com sites. Um, they just don't stand up uh, academically like that. Look at the uh, research applications that are there. Uh, we're talking about uh, inferences, deductions, things of that nature. And then when you've got all your questions done, you know, proofread the paper, um, put it on spell check. Um, if you're home and you got folks around, say, uh, I'll be making some noise next door because I'll be reading my paper. You read it out loud. You can do a lot with that. These are techniques and skill sets that when you move on and do other kinds of work like that. Or if you have a friend, uh, you could read sections of it and say, what do you think? And if they say, I have no idea what you're talking about, then you can kind of explain it to them. And then you might want to look at that because the content's pretty specific, but it it gives you a chance then to explain something to someone. And then you look at your paper and say, maybe I should put that in there that I just explained that to you. If we were in the class, um, I would do some of these, but we, since we're not there, this is about the best we could uh, use for that. Use a quote sparingly. Um, uh, in a paper, if you had uh, a couple of uh, three or four lines uh, once or twice, but you know, some of them, you know, such and such said this, and you know, I kind of emailed them back, not for your class, but the others, I said, you, you know, you, there isn't much writing in there. You're just quoting paragraphs, and that's not what we need here. Uh, you put it in your own words. So that's a skill and an art into itself. But use quotes are used when there's something so impressive. You know, when Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, take down this wall, you put that in quotes because that's a, you know, you know, ask not what you, you know, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Those are quotes given by key individuals that are important, that stay with people. Uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, I will not seek, nor will I accept your nomination for the presidency. Wow, big news. So yeah, quotes are there that, in other words, you can't say it any better. So you use the quote to as uh, a focus point as the evidence. And that's another key point for you uh, in answering the questions. Make sure you focus uh, you focus on evidence uh, like that, and you know be as concise and as specific uh, with the the evidence as you can. You should be fine on that. All right. So that's all that I have at this point. Anything that you want to bring up, uh, questions, comments, I'll turn it over to you, and then I'll give you the takeaway for today. All right, if anything comes up, just interrupt me. Professor Harkins, I have a question. I'll stop, try to answer it, or try to get back to you with an email. If you have questions, you can email me later uh, today. Be ha happy to help you. All right, takeaways for today is uh, I'm going to focus first on uh, partition because uh, throughout history, we've seen partitions um, uh, before, during, and after wars. And what do partitions lead to? Um, we call them like demilitarized zones. You know, we've got one in Korea. We had one in Vietnam for a while. We've got one with India and Pakistan. You've got other areas. And so what what is this? So the takeaway for today, the first part is um, what uh, is happening to this area of Palestine uh, after World War II? What's the, the strategy? Uh, to create a, a country or a state called Palestine. And then the second, if there's time, I'm going to get into the causes and outcomes of the Iranian revolution uh, from the end of the war to the loss of the Shah, and we'll bring that up to uh, modern times as well. All right, so let's see what we can do here. Uh, and there's a lot. There's, I've got some other maps. If I have time, I'll get one of those up, and you can really see what it looks like. It's so fragmented after after the war, World War One, and um, and World War Two. So we're gonna, you know, look at the early period as well. So what you're looking at is the map, and um, we can see Israel and 
in the kind of the blue area, and then we can see um, areas uh, occupied and controlled by the uh, the Palestinians. And so, uh, one of the key issues to bring order and stability to this area is well, we have to partition, meaning we divide areas. And so, to start. Um, the problems that encounter is all these mandates were given at the end of World War um, One. Britain, France, most of these major countries are pretty weakened uh, by World War One, and from 1919 to 1939 they try to rebuild themselves, and some do, but um, they run into the depression and uh, lots of trade issues, lots of turmoil. After World War I, uh, the Middle East is divided up into a series of territories uh, that are called mandates. And of course, the League of Nations is in charge of the mandates. And so these countries request mandates of territory or the League will give them mandates in order to secure order and stability after a World War I. Of course, we're not in the League of Nations, so we're, we sit on the outside of it. And so we don't have any mandates, uh, territories that we can control. And so what happens is um, Britain is weakened after World War I, and she's very weakened after World War II. And so what happens is uh, they will basically uh, give up the mandates. It's different than colonization. What it does is divide up areas, just as our mandate would have been um, West Berlin. You know, the French had a third of it, the British had a third of it, we had a third of it, and they just pulled out the British and French and left us whole bag with West Berlin. Um, so we were there in Japan as well. O but that's occupation. It isn't a mandate. We know, you know, you occupy for a while and then you turn it back to the um, a new form of government that uh, should move in a very peaceful direction. So post-World War II, Britain is extremely weakened, as most countries are including the Soviet Union, we're not because we're at heavy production. And uh, we're going to be on that uh, push for about 50 years until about 1995 when things start to slow a little bit. Okay, And so what happens is um, the League of Nations collapses. We get into the war, World War II, and World War II is over, and Britain can't, uh, can't handle the mandates, neither can the French. So uh, the mandate... Of Palestine's turned over to the United Nations, which comes into being. This is what Roosevelt was looking at. It's a whole nother concept. And it has its pluses and minuses. So right now, back to the UN, okay? And there's three Zionist groups in Palestine now. So we talked a little bit about them before uh, World War II. We talked about them uh, during uh, World War I and after World War I. And now we've got three Zionist groups that are in Palestine during World uh, after the war. And so what they want is they told the British, well, we helped you during the war. Uh, we actually enlisted. Uh, there was honest, uh, units in the British Army. They needed everything, everybody they could get to hold uh, Egypt and these other areas. And now all of a sudden, Britain's going to pull out like that. Okay. And the UN comes up with the idea that we need to partition the area because the best thing we can do is get people separated and we'll have uh, some form of peace, order, and stability. Well, the, the two other groups, there are Arabs uh, that are in Palestine, referred to as Arab Palestinians, uh, and there's nationalists, and they don't like the idea of partition. I mean, it's drawing lines. It's different than creating a country or a nation or an empire. Um, if you go back in time, and one of the keys to success of many of the imperial systems, although you know people generally talk about them very on, in a very negative basis, and I said, well, that's fine. Uh, tell me how many wars we've had over borders and lines. Tell me how many wars we've had in imperial systems over borders. Border people generally got along because they knew that and people left them alone. And so they said, well, look, it's fine. The border's fine. Uh, we're over there. They're over here. These people function. They trade. Uh, it's a system that, that functions. It's a wonderful filter. Let's not get things upset. Well, and they got upset in the Balkans in World War I, and they got upset in other areas. So what happens is now we're within a state, a country. We've got what we have is uh, 
partition. Well, two major groups don't want to have anything to do with partition. And the UN does, okay? And so what is created then is, of course, an Anglo-American committee. The British won't do anything without us because they don't have the resources to do it. And they tried for a few years after the war, but in 1960, that was about it. You know, they had all kinds of missile projects and building huge aerodromes all over Afghanistan and the Middle East, like they were going to just, you should look at those plants someday. They're just phenomenal. We couldn't even keep up with them, but they had no resources to do it. Um, there's shells of buildings that the, the Russians, the Soviets use in Afghanistan. They're bigger than any stadium you would, you can think of today. And they had built them these huge aerodromes for their big British Air Force and missiles and nothing. None of that happened. They just, they did, they were in a lot of turmoil economically, politically after the war. So Britain and the U.S. put together an Anglo-American committee to deal with it. But first year after the war, 1946 violence uh, erupts in Palestine. Um, as the U.N. starting to come online in the first session and the talk about all of this, coming when the war ends is we're going to partition in these areas. And they don't like that. No. And so the committee then looks at recommends certificates of immigration because people want to leave Europe. Um, they were leaving it before the war, during the war, and right after the war because it's dis destitute. And everybody thinks, and that's why history is so important. If I could take you back to those locations, and I can. I mean, we could visit them if the situation was better and explain a little bit. But um, a lot of the prejudice that was going on before and during the war continued after the war. It's just that the people had civilian clothes on and people that were there of different religious groups wanted out, wanted out of Europe. They came here, Canada, I guess they were leaving Europe in droves. But there were still the animosities that were left there and even grew more against the Soviets and other people, even against us. You should have come much earlier. You should have done this. You should have done that. And it's like, whoa, wow. Yeah, a lot of refugees. So. Many people want to leave and they want to go to Israel. Uh, and some of them aren't even of the Jewish faith. They're not Hebrews. They want to, they think this is a new place. It's like, you know, immigrants that came here and headed out to the West, uh, that land of opportunity. They thought this is a new start and we've got to have peace, order, security, safety, and be able to worship and do the things that we normally do. So it's going to take a while for Europe to move through that. This is the aftermath, and it's usually left out of most discussions of the Middle East. As to this. So these committees, you have to get a certificate. You just can't go anywhere to show up here. You have to get certificates. So what it is is how many, and there's hundreds of them, thousands of them. What do they have? Their homes have been destroyed. Uh, they were working in plants, whatever, different parts of Europe. Warsaw is so badly damaged. It's just like, some want to rebuild, some don't. It usually falls into those two categories. Either you're going to rebuild where you live or you're going to leave. Some people just walk away. The same thing in civilizations. That's why all these great empires and civilizations are, you know, people, oh, wow, look at the city in the sand. A lot of archaeology. Yeah, what happened here? Well, the question is, why are they in the sand? You know, why did a great civilization end up in the sand? Well, people left. Why did they leave? Well, they wanted a better life for themselves. I'm tired of turmoil, tired of taxes, tired of exploitation, tired of wars. You know, new group comes in, promises them all this, and it never happens. They just left, and they formed a new group, new countries. They move. All right. So Britain uh, begins to maintain some order and stability in '46. All right. She can do that. There's still troops in there, so this is the lead up to it. New Anglo-American proposal to create two autonomous provinces. That's us with the British two autonomous provinces. Now we're talking. See, this is like the old Ottoman Empire. We got provinces. They People understand that. All right. Good. And they're, they're independent. All right. What that then could lead to is like territories in the United States could become states. You got two independent provinces. Wow. They could become what? Yes, they could become states. Are they like that? It's, this is like, okay, we're making some progress here. They know what a province is. They 
that's all this they've been all part of the ottoman empire they know that they know where those they know what a province is and it reports to somebody who does it report to well they don't have the next level up i'm not going to report to the u.s or the british no so maybe then those two provinces could get together and create a country see there's there's some opportunity here you see this, but it's going to get all derailed, and you'll, you know that. Both sides rejected the proposal, okay? Because there were people at the top who didn't like that because they wanted it all, you see. You don't call them elites, but there's a group that make the decision, and everybody underneath them, a lot of them said, well, why, why did you reject that? Well, because we, we don't want two. We just want one, okay, which means there's no compromise, so they're not going to get anything. And you see where they are today? Right. Okay. Truman in the U.S. support this 100,000, these immigration immigrants to Palestine. And that is a small number compared to the many that wanted to come. There's still immigration uh, going on in different parts of the world uh, today as people flee these areas because of the turmoil that's there. They leave their history, their culture, their family, lots of things behind, their ancestors, their ancestral lands, their ancestral homes. They just leave them looking for something better. So in 1947, Britain takes the question to the, uh, the United Nations, and the UN comes back with partition. Not two provinces, not one state, not one country, not a timetable in five years, ten years, this will happen now. The UN says we need to have partition, okay? So the partition plan is unworkable. If you have two elements and one doesn't want it or both don't want it, well, then it's not going to work. Okay. Lots of things could have happened. Everybody could have, you know, all the European powers and everybody else could have pulled out and said, okay, you work it out. What do you mean? We're not going to contact with you. We're not going to trade. We're not going to do what you've, you know, you handle the ships when they come in. You, you take care of it. No telling what would have happened like that, but that's called self-determination, which they really didn't get. As long as you've got somebody behind you at the table that's a big, powerful country, pe these representatives are going to talk a different tune because they know they got, they've got that. And so the Soviet Union is going to get involved, the United States is going to get involved, and the British and the French are literally going to, you know, they'll be out of the room like that. Uh, Britain decides to terminate the mandate on May 15th, 1948. That means we're not the caretakers. We're not going to have law. I mean, we're going to, we're just going to vacate it. The mandate runs out. They had one before World War uh, II. They got, they got it after World War II. They got it from the League of Nations. And it's a great story to see all these mandates is how the League was wanting to, to work with uh, the Middle East. And a lot of it has to do with these treaties that come out of World War One and World War Two, and that's why the Middle East is in a lot of turmoil, is because both of those wars, what came out in, in the uh, the Far East, uh, Indochina area, all of them, and the Balkans, they were sort of the um, footnotes uh, to the big treaty, and they became a big part of the text after that, because this is where all these um, uh, secondary tertiary wars develop after world war ii all right so the un uh partition created a civil war all right that's not the united nations is supposed to be dedicated toward preventing uh, wars like that but if they don't want partition then there's a civil war all right so the british are pulling out all right david ben gurion proclaims then the new state of israel and Harry Truman, President of the United States, will recognize uh, the new state of Israel, the country of Israel, like that. And, of course, the, the Soviet Union will recognize uh, Israel as well. Uh, and so now we've created a state, one. Okay. The Arab League said, no, we don't recognize that. It goes back to this, and there's a litany. You could take a whole course on this, what I'm kind of giving you the overview of how the steps are. Uh, coming out of uh, the the ending of World War II. So many of these uh, problems that we face today for the last 75 years uh, going strong uh, radiate out of many of the decisions that were made. Um, we probably needed, um, but I'm not, 
it's not definitive, needed a lot stronger leadership after the war. And Truman gives some of it, but Eisenhower, he does at the Suez crisis, but uh, they're all worried. We're all worried about the Soviet Union and what the Chinese are doing because they're just about ready to launch in 1949 with the People's Republic of China. Um, there was an opportunity here to, I think, to sit these different uh, constituencies down and said, why don't you want two provinces? And I think if they had to do it over, if you take them from where they are today and you move them back to the, the 1940s, we might have had a different outcome. Uh, but here, here was the opportunity for the two states um, to come about. And, and the idea of a prov maybe starting as two provinces and then over time being a workable solution. Uh, but today it's just the, the, the gulf is, is too, uh, too wide. Uh, it's, it, they can't bridge it. Maybe they will. There were some good uh, starting processes with that, with Saudi Arabia and that, uh, uh, the Abraham Accord, uh, which you've got to sit down and, and really engage them. All right. So what do we have? Uh, therefore, when the British pull out, the war begins between Egypt coming in, um, supporting uh, the Palestinians because we don't want partition. We don't want a state. We don't want that. And so, you know, the Arab League gets involved, Arab Palestinians get, uh, they get involved, the nationalists get involved, and other countries in the Middle East get involved, all right? And so Egypt then invades Palestine, invades this area because of the actions that uh, started. Truman recognizes uh, Israel and the Russians come in and do the same thing. So what do we have? Uh, a short period of time. Uh, June 11th to July 8th, and then a truce is in, invoked uh, because it takes a lot of equipment. Uh, it's a it's a hot war going on. Uh, China is busy uh, trying to get itself set up. Uh, by the fall of 1949, the People's Republic of China and the uh, People's Liberation Army uh, is still active uh, in uh, China, and they're still there today, and they won't step down until. Uh, they liberate uh, Taiwan. That's what their the main goal is. But even if they did that, uh, which I don't think is going to happen, uh, but if anything could happen. Uh, the People's Liberation Army isn't going anywhere. Uh, that's a big part of, of China. So they're pretty busy in those areas. But here, uh, a truce is, in, is invoked and uh, the fighting stops. And um, that doesn't last very long. And you notice that in the Middle East is one of those same trends you know they, all right we have a truce and everything's supposed to be fine and then groups go back and rearm get more equipment get angrier somebody says this watch the news whatever's going on and then all of a sudden they're back fighting again so a second truce is in effect now if you look at the map these areas are not uh, we're talking about uh, shorter distances and you can cause a lot of damage uh because you you're not impeded uh, with forest areas and large mountains and you know and huge rivers you can move tanks and equipment you can get air power in there I mean you, you got a lot of blue sky so there's a lot of opportunity here to engage in conflict in a in a, a short distance and so um, fighting starts again and then there's a second truce that has to get into play here okay. Uh, Israel then uh, invades the Sinai and uh, Egypt withdraws. So that's generally what we have. We go back and forth like that until we finally, over the next, you know, 15, 20 years, as this continues, um, uh, Jimmy Carter uh, is elected in 1976, and they have the Camp David Accords, Menachem Begin. Uh, they work on this. They try to get uh, Anwar Sadat. Um, uh, is involved and then he's assassinated and Mubarak comes in and then he's removed. Uh, and then the Muslim Brotherhood uh, had a uh, person and then um, the military puts up Sisi who is now the, the current leader uh, in, in Egypt. And so here's Israel invades the Sinai and the Egyptians uh, withdraw, okay? All right, so with that, that gives you just a little, uh, if I can, I might want to shift over and see if I can show you 
Um, I'll start with the uh, Iran, but I might be able to give you um, the partition areas. Okay. All right, here's my map. Palestine, 1919 to 1939. Look at the mandates. Look at them. Right? Right up here at the top, look, we got Syria and Lebanon. And the Russians are there today. Okay. British mandate over here for Mesopotamia. Sultanate, independent of the mandates. Separate kingdom, right here. British mandate for Palestine. Over here, British protectorate. Egypt, the protectorate's different than a mandate. The mandate, British mandate for Palestine. Look at it. Look at how big that is. You see, cuts across areas. Out of this is going to be Jordan, Transjordan. And Britain sets it up because they want the oil pipeline coming through. They don't want to be bothered. But they've got a mandate here for Palestine. They've got a mandate here for Mesopotamia. They're all the way into the Tigris Euphrates. They've got it all. And that's basically for oil. And then they're down here at Aqaba, uh, outlet for oil. Go ahead, Devin. Don't, I mean, like, these are multi-ethnic regional zones. Like, how, how would they expect these people to just understand borders all of a sudden like this? They don't. That's the goal of it. I, I mean, as couldn't they? Couldn't, people, because you can. Aren't they, like, historians? you know influencing yeah, the british policy are. makers like won't won't yeah. they know it's not going to go well or it doesn't matter well, they're just trying to do for as they long can. as long as right well as long as they're there they'll pit one group against the next and each each group will go to the british trying to get a better deal for their their group britain promise them all kinds of things they're good at that all a lot of countries in the world are good at that that's how i keep them off balance until they figure out that they're being had, and they ought to unite themselves and see if they can, the British can go home. A lot of these individuals really needed to figure, you know, as to what the Ottomans were trying to do. They fall into the same trap and say, well, all right, we're here with the British. Uh, we'll send our people over there and see if we can negotiate a better deal with the British. We'll get more land. Or we'll get more corn or grain or whatever it is. Remember, this is after the war, so they're somewhat destitute in a lot of these areas, and the British has have a— you know, they don't, these groups within these mandates don't know how bad off countries are in the world after the war. Right. They don't. And so their main interest is saying, well, there's going to be jobs for you. And these jobs after World War One are going to be oil. And then the same thing after World War Two are those resources. But you see, these are all the mandates that are created. And after World War Two, the mandates are just going to be, they're going to end them. And that's when the wars break out. You don't have a, it's like a UN peacekeeping who can't sometimes keep the peace. So when they, when they pull out, both elements at it against each other. You know, the question is, why are they fighting each other? And when you sit down and start to talk, it gets to the point where they're not going to budge just as they wouldn't budge in 48. They did. They weren't budging in 68, 78, 88, 98. Right. And I don't think they'll be budging in 20, 28, but I don't know. We'll have to see because the mechanisms uh, aren't there. Uh, these areas, if you look at the map, they're small. Uh, and they're, they're, as you mentioned, Devin, there are a lot of diversity in these areas. So the, the question is how do, you know, the supply center is gone, the ability for them to, to function collectively. And right up here, boy, they're still here. You got the Russians right up there. Absolutely. Yep. They're not going anywhere. They're still there today, right? This is the old French territory. And so you can see what happens after World War I. It's the French and British that are there. After World War II, that's pretty much it. Um, they can't hold these mandates. They can't hold them in the Middle East. They can't hold them in the Balkans. They can't hold them in Indochina, uh, Southeast Asia. And who ends up holding them in Southeast Asia? We do. All right. And we still do in those areas. All right, we're not going to go into this area here. I'm going to shift over uh, and get us into Iran, uh, and I'll pick up with that um, 
next week as well uh, for us. Because the, the whole scenario as to what takes place um, in Iran is really uh, critical with the so-called Iranian revolution uh, that takes place. Um, let's see if I can get it up and uh, move on it here. All right, it'll take me a minute or two to get this one back up for us. We've done the early history of Iran. Okay. All right, there we are. There's the Shah and his wife uh, ghosted in the background. So we're going to look at the Middle East, 1945 forward and to get into what happens uh, here. As we've already talked about other areas, uh, we focused on the mandates, e Egypt, what's happening in Israel, Palestine, uh, the creation of Jordan, the Transjordan, Lebanon, Syria, all of that, a little bit on Iraq, and now what happens here uh, in Iran. Okay, now, in Iran, by uh, 19, by the 1960s, colonialism um, is almost over. And so the Persians, the, the Iranians, uh, with their structure, they still have the Shah. Uh, and we went through that early part of what happened uh, from 1700 up to 1800, and we went through the wars, one and two, and now we're into this post-war period. And so the idea of uh, colonial powers is doing pretty well. Now, Egypt, most of the population lived in the Nile Valley and the Delta, okay? That's where they are, you know, just like in this country, major cities have huge populations and, and have a lot of power uh, in the way of voting, uh, economic resources, all of that, all right? So Egypt, we know where these folks are. They're in the Delta uh, and they're, you know, Cairo, these areas uh, where the main population uh, is centered, okay? However, in most of the Middle East, and especially uh, Iran, uh, there's financial strains that were developing uh, because of uh, two wars and a depression. And on both wars, many of these countries were on the wrong side. And so there's some punitive things as well. And now all this turmoil takes place as the French and British start to pull out. And when they pull out, uh, the Russians, the Soviets just decide to uh, come walking in. The Chinese have some interest because they're set up in 1949. And so now here's the review that we covered. Israel is independent. We have a new state created. All right. That then sets up the stage for other states. Okay, this is the plan. The UN looks at it. Other countries look at it. Well, now what we need to do since 1922, when the Ottoman Empire ceased to have a, a semi-decentralized system um, of over this huge territory, a confederated system. So now we see countries becoming independent. So everybody's out to grab land and see who can help them. And like the Soviets, the Chinese, like the US to do this, okay? Now, in so doing, uh, if you're going to be a state, uh, what you want to do, uh, and this is, goes for Iran and Iraq, especially for Iran, uh, a large commitment to national defense and security. And I could ask you the question, does Iran do that today? That's correct. Does Egypt do that today? Iran really does it. They want nuclear. Uh, Egypt wants them. I assure everybody, national defense and security. But what that refers to are two words, order and security. That's what people want. They want an ordered and they like routine. They like security. You know, they like to send their children to school without having them get shot. You know, at the end of the day, they want to come home, watch television, go shopping, and not worry about being robbed, run over, or somebody dropping bombs on them. Okay. And they think we can get the wars over. Let's see what we can do. And so, in order to do that, to make sure, but we can have that internally. We got to have a national defense and security and make a large commitment to it. And since they're small, 
very diverse. And if you look at the area, they don't have, you know, the mountains and the snow. They don't have, they have great gifts and other natural resources like oil. But the reality of it is, is it's pretty wide open territory for air power and things like that. And so they're going to take a large part of their budget, like ours. You know, we have ours in social systems and the military. They're going to do the same thing. And so people are going to have to pay for that. If you want order, peace, order and stability, which is like peace, happiness, you know, so you can do what you need to do without worrying. Uh, you know, and many of these folks lived through two world wars and the depression. Okay. Uh, Jordan supported the Eisenhower doctrine after World War II. So for, you know, we'll, we'll get into Iran here, but uh, this is just kind of walking us through this. The, the Jordan, which is going to be created out of this Transjordan, it was that British mandate, okay, supported the Eisenhower uh, doctrine. Okay, what's that? Well, if you do certain things, uh, you're going to get uh, aid from the United States. Oh, boy, that's good. But then you have the Russians coming in saying, well, we can do this, we can do that. You know, it's like the Russians got the, the, the you know, to build the Aswan Dam. We wanted to do it. Uh, Eisenhower, all that Kennedy got involved and, and we just weren't going to pay that kind of money. So the Soviets came in and it, it's, it's good, but there's a lot of problems with it even today um, because of the construction and the engineering of it is, you know, you got it, but it could have been built a lot better. Uh, but anyway, what happens is President Eisenhower, our Congress, creates a doctrine that if you move in this direction, uh, you're going to get some money. Uh, you're going to get what we call foreign aid. And so the superpowers begin to move in, or you can call them superpowers or the powers after World War II. Um, everybody wants to move up. Uh, it's, you talk about the miracle on the Han, which is in China and Japan. You haven't seen anything to the Russian miracle because they are so destitute at the end of World War II, and look at how they move. They move very quickly, but they're consuming other countries' resources. So it's like, yes, the Middle East, oil, right? They got some material minerals that we need. And so what starts then is this process that we're going to give aid to these countries, and that starts it, okay? And they participated in all uh, Israeli conflicts. This is uh, Jordan. Egypt. They'll go back and forth. All right. So what we're trying to do is sort that out by providing some foreign aid to see if we can get these countries, these areas, uh, to begin cooperating together, working in a collective uh, manner. They did under the Ottomans to an extent. Uh, why can't they do it now? Okay. So all the way up to 1994, it takes that long before Jordan and Israel can have a peace accord. That's over 40 years, about four, more than 40 years. If you look at it, you can you can see where the countries are today and look at the struggle that comes with them. And we're still uh, under Eisenhower and others providing all that aid. Now, if you're uh, supplying that money, what are we getting for it? And you see, that's what you have to say today is like if we put this money in. So you put money into a bank or you buy something with it, you're not putting it in there to lose it all. You say, look, I gave you that. I, this is what I expect out of it, and I'm not getting it. And so what are we getting out of this? Well, you can say, well, long term, you know, we got a Jordan and Israel got a peace accord, right? The war ended in 1945. It's almost 50 years to do that, okay? Lebanon, different factions in the country allied with different world powers. Can you beat that? Mm -hmm. That's like in Illinois. Northern Illinois would have an alliance uh, with, the, with the Russians. Central Illinois would have an alliance with the Chinese. And Southern Illinois would have an alliance with Australia. You, know, you can't do that in the United States. But in Lebanon, there's different factions. This is what Devin was getting at. So each country in the world that has an influence say, well, we can do this, we can go in, and they, they work with these factions. It's the same thing they were doing during World War I and World War II. Okay? Well, we'll go to you if you provide this for us. See, that's the scenario they have. As long as you feed them, they'll keep coming back to you, and if they don't like what you're feeding them, they'll say, well, I'm going to go over here to this country because they're going to give me more apple pie than you're giving me. 
okay? Or they'll give me more bread or whatever it might be, but they're looking for hardware. What are they looking for? Materials for defense. Mines, barbed wire, border gates, control, all that. Airplanes, missiles, all that. That's where it comes from. And so how can your country have a country when the country has alliances? So of the three alliance of these three the, the, these countries, different factions in Lebanon, um, how, how could you do that? Well, these enclaves of people that are there like allying with this country and not the other. Okay, And that causes a lot of problems because those countries come in and they foment difficulty saying, you know, those people on your border, just you know, not even on your border, they're your neighbors are terrible because they allied with this country. And we won't get into which ones they are, but you can figure them out. I think the Soviets are a big part of this. Okay, They fought a civil war in Lebanon from 1975 until 1990. Our American Civil War was 1861 to 1865, about four years. Look at this. Remember I gave you that overview a couple weeks ago? Here's the evidence. That long fighting a civil war. Go ahead. When you're giving us that overview, you're talking about the cycles, right? Yep. Okay. Remember I said civil war was part of it? Yeah, yeah. At the end I of gave the you cycle, all the civil, generic yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Here's here's the evidence now. See, I gave you all that generalization. Here's the evidence. Lebanon. All right? Today, they still struggle with Syria and Israel. Lebanon. All right? Wow. Syria. Split with Egypt in 1975 over the peace accord with Israel. So you see what happens. You know, one or two groups get a peace accord and the others don't like it. Mm -hmm. And now Syria is going to split with Egypt, right? Because of what Egypt's trying to do uh, to bring peace, order, and stability to a region, okay? Then they move toward Jordan and the Soviets. Ah, now you know who's in Jordan, right? So what you see is the British and the French are being replaced by the Soviets and the U.S. Right. Soviets are still in Syria, aren't they? That's right. One thing about them, when they show up, they just don't go home. They, they, they just keep staying. They got staying power, and there's certain reasons. You know, they're trying to regenerate... Uh, some of their status in the world, but they've got bigger economic problems. Okay, 1980, they signed a 20-year agreement of friendship uh, with Jordan and the Soviets. Wow. Okay. Terrorist activities start up. Mm hmm. And they continue today. The terrorist activities really started after World about 48, 49. Uh, when the war is over, they were these groups were moving against the Germans, or they were working for the Germans back and forth. They learned a lot of that. They were trained in Germany. They came back after the war, uh, denied that they, you know, the Germans forced them to do that. So they learned the trade uh, during World War One and World War Two, and they practiced it uh, like that because that's what the Germans could do uh, to infiltrate um, American and British and local forces uh, working for the Allies in World War II, they, they turned them into terrorist groups and like guerrilla warfare and, and paid them well to do it. So during the day, they worked for the Allies, and, and at night, they worked for the Axis. That was going on, okay? Turkey, okay? Uh, alliances with the United States. Good ally, but moves back and forth, has interests with the Soviet Union as well, okay? Iran aligned with the U.S. after the war until the Iranian Revolution, right? Mm -hmm. We believed, I gave you some of that, uh, after the war that Iran and Saudi Arabia would be the two stabilizing forces in the Middle East, and we worked to that extent. So we helped Iran. Uh, they align with us, with the Shah. We provide air power, and the Shah keeps an eye on Iraq, and they go back and forth with the Saudis, and then eventually that's all going to come apart. And today, uh, the Iranians support uh, 
the Yemenis, uh, the folks in Oman, uh, they support uh, the Syrians, they're working with the Russians, and they're, the, the Saudis don't like it. You know, they launch missiles, they, they bomb down into the, the end of the uh, Arabian Peninsula where Yemen is, and lots of turmoil. And then once we got that Abraham Accord, it's very good uh, that they're trying to you know, marginalize the Iran's uh, activities in this area. So after the war, Iran does this, okay? 1995, it's almost been um, 26 years, U.S. cuts all trade and invest investments with Iran. And this goes back even before to the hostage crisis and the whole Iranian revolution. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of giving you, you know, this is current as well, 1995. And so you just can't say, well, this, you know, this isn't the current administration or the previous administration or the one before that. And that this has gone on for quite a while. Once Iran um, removes the Shah and moves to this sort of a uh, government controlled by the, by the religious leaders and they make those decisions and then they're gonna move into more technological uh, areas like nuclear weapons and you know there's a big um, rift between uh, Iran and what's going on in Israel uh, and you see all the armaments and all of this talk that uh, that ramps up all right so you know we're, we're kind of getting a little um, foreshadowing of things here okay so U.S. post Suez um, and with Israel so once we get through that Suez crisis that takes place, it's 1956 and Nasser, the United States starts to move much closer to Israel as a stabilizing force in the Middle East. Uh, they're one of, we have an alliance with Israel, we're allies. Um, sometimes you wouldn't know that from what you hear, uh, but we are, all right? And so what happens then is we're going to see the development of a major revolution um, in, in Iran that's being fomented. Uh, it starts in the 60s and it goes forward to the point where um, it's going to move forward in the 70s. And then uh, we're going to see um, American hostages taken under Carter's administration. And we're going to see the, uh, before that, the fall of the, the Shah and uh, he becomes like homeless. No country wants to take him in. Uh, he's, we don't keep him in power. Uh, he blames us because we let him down and he was very ill. I think the, he came here for some treatment, um, but in the process uh, he will die um, outside the US, I believe. And his son uh, is still alive and I don't know where he is now, the rest of his family like that. When the Shah falls, um, monarchy ended. And part of the Iranian revolution is this, like all revolutions, it occurred because things were getting much better in Iran, but not fast enough. And what happens is it's the same things that the Ottomans faced, but it comes here uh, for uh, Iran in the 1960s, the 1970s, uh, and the 1980s and beyond. Um, they moved so rapidly uh, that the, the conservatives got alarmed. And one of it is they were building like high rise housing. They didn't like that. Uh, more uh, coffee shops, uh, more Western dress, uh, all these Western, this modernization, just look at how the Shah is dressed. It, it just, it's the same thing that the Ottomans faced, but they're facing it. Um, about 100 years later. And the religious group, the conservatives just couldn't, you know, they, they would not accept this. Uh, they accepted modern military weapons and things like that, but they couldn't accept how, you know, they were building these, you know, apartments, condos, things like that. And things were happening in there that they just didn't like, you know, throughout their whole history, hotels, motels, things like that were not part of what they liked. You know, those were we're not part of their cultural aspects. So what happens is 
this modernization period is going and this progressive period causes a very reactionary element. And the West was pushing it. Everybody in the West was pushing it. They pushed it from the early period of the Ottomans. They didn't like record players and all of that. No, they didn't like Western dress. But if you look at the world today, most of the key leaders, even dictators, dress in Western attire, including China. So, so the monarchy is going to end. This is the one that goes back to the Safavids, okay? And what it is called is an Islamic uh, revolution. That's what it is. And what happens is the United States Embassy in Tehran um, is, uh, is seized and hostages are taken. Um, and it's like, wow, now the Shah is gone. And the Ayatollah Khomeini, who is in France, many of these conservative leaders, once the Shah uh, continued in power after World War II, they left and went to France. And they're going to come back uh, to take over because the Shah actually abdicates and leaves. Okay. Now, a couple things and then we'll hang on. We'll move on. Uh, we're over time. It's a 15 month hostage crisis. Yep. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't budge. They were released when Reagan was elected. Carter couldn't get them back. All right. The Shaw is supported by Nixon and the Nixon Doctrine. And we know what happens when Richard Nixon gets involved in Watergate and has to resign. And we got Gerald Ford coming in. He, he's not elected in nine, uh, Ford's never been elected president, wasn't elected vice president, you know, ran in 76. He's defeated by uh, Jimmy Carter. And um, what happens? 71. 1971, the Shaw is the modern successor to Cyrus the Great. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Two more, and then we'll, we'll close it off for today so you can see this. Okay, and Nixon's elected in 72, gets himself embroiled in Watergate. He opens China up, and what happens is the things are, are going to happen. Uh, uh, the war in Vietnam, um, Ford doesn't support him. We'll lose South Vietnam. Uh, we're going to lose uh, Iran. And so what happens is this. Khomeini, the Ayatollah Khomeini, is in exile in France and then Iraq. Okay. Who supports him? You know. Soviets. Within a seven-year period, the Shah is out. Khomeini comes back in. Okay. All right. We'll stop here. I'll pick this up uh, next week. We'll finish this, and I'll round it out and, and try to pick up any of the loose ends I've had. But uh, it's pretty powerful history, uh, the kinds of things that are happening, especially everybody studies. You've heard about Watergate and things like that, you know, the uh, – the timing of Nixon's resignation and the coming of Ford, uh, the world really takes advantage of that. We lose, not lose, but we pull, you know, we needed to support the South Vietnamese with air power. Ford said, no, we're not going to do that. We've got uh, all of the work. Uh, China is chomping at the bit since Nixon opened them up. And then we're going to lose, uh, in a sense, the you know, Nixon supported the Shaw. Uh, he probably would have continued to support him. And what happens with Ford? And Carter, Carter refuses to do anything uh, with that. And so when people, you know, say, well, we got the Camp David Accord, I say, yeah, but what happened here? But look what we have. As a result today, we've got this issue with Iran and all these nuclear things. What was going on? Right. Yeah. All right. We'll pick it up next week. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Be uh, safe out there. Things are getting better, but uh you know, a lot of conflicting information, but uh, be safe, be careful, be cautious. Um, I'll see you next week. I'm going to close down my screen. If you have any questions about any of the course material, uh, go ahead and send me an email.